morning, good morning. And good morning. I just wanted to add an extra good morning today because I'm excited. I have a great group of women today who are joining me on the Roundtable Talk Show. I am your host, of course, Sharifa Hardy. And do I have an amazing show for you today? But I'm going to ask you to do what I always ask you to do. And that's right. Go interrupt someone's sleep. Go wake someone up. Go wake your friend up. Call them, text them, tweet them, share the message, whatever you have to do. Friends don't let friends miss out on the Roundtable Talk Show. So that's right. It's your responsibility to make sure they have this information in front of them. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first guest so we can start our amazing show. Our first guest is Sanja Gar, and she started designing and making clothes for her Barbie when she was just 10 years old. And a few years later, she is now a fashion designer. Good morning. How are you? Good morning, Sharifa. I'm good. How are you? I am excited to have you. I'm excited to learn all about you and what you do. One of the conversations we tend to have on the Roundtable Talk Show is people kind of find what, they, what they're supposed to do, their purpose, for lack of a better um, term, um, you know, how they find it. Like for me, I was that kid that loved to talk. I was that kid that drove my mother crazy because I was she yeah. I was asking questions and she was like, "Are you just stop talking?" But now I'm a talk show host. So for you, your love of design came at an early age and you utilized it for the rest of your life. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. So I mean, I um, you know I grew up in India, so the, the very basic professional uh, you know life career paths that you think in India that you want to be is either a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer. You know, nobody is like at age ten says, "Oh, I want to be a fashion designer." But you know, I I was so fascinated by colors, by fabrics, and you know, I used to watch a lot of TV. So I, I would want to dress up my doll in the latest fashion and kind of follow the trends that I saw on television. So that kind of, you know, uh, fascinated me so much, it gave me so much joy that I kept doing it and I, and I kept playing uh, with my doll and creating those clothes. And then I realized this was something that really, really interested me. And then I decided to pursue it as a career. Now you mentioned in India that typically you have a set career career path that's for you. When you decided to go in a different direction and go into fashion design, what was the response from the people around you? I mean, when, you know, when you're a child, you can say anything and people laugh it off because they're like, yeah, whatever. And then when you grow up, you know, and you're seriously considering something, then of course, you know, my parents were like, are you sure? Are you sure that you want to do this? Because I, I was very intelligent and, you know, kind of ac academically bent too. So they were like, you could do something that would be more academic. You know, you could become a lawyer and then probably go into uh, the civil services that's what they call them in india be a part of the you know office or something like that so my father really pushed me towards that but you know my calling was fashion and i was you know this is just what something i love to do and every day i do it it's seamless it brings me so much joy it does not feel like work mm -hmm. it just feels like meditation to me doing you know designing creating clothes kind of promoting my work and you, you know, if you, if you love color, if you love pattern, if you love to travel, go on to go on to sandhyagarak.com, check out my work, things that inspire me. Uh, I would spell that out, S-A-N-D-H-Y-A-G-A-R-G.com. Uh, we have a web shop, we have blogs about making things, about traveling, about what inspires a fashion designer. Uh, I got an amazing opportunity uh, on, um, of being on Project Runway season 13. So I talk about Project Runway as well. So, you know, there's tons, tons of information for fashion designers. Um, if you want to go check my website. We're definitely going to check out your website. But one of the things I'm curious of, I love your expressions, how when you talk, you kind of move and you can kind of, you're one of those people that you can kind of read 
their expressions, like when you're happy, when something kind of bothers you, at least from this initial interaction. But you said, my father wanted me to work in the office or something like that. And it was like, almost like you're like dreading, like you have this, I because I'm like that. I don't know. That's why I picked it up. Like I can't work in an office, a cubicle, a space. I have to be free to move, to go. So how did you know that working in this office wasn't for you? I mean, you know, I, I always also very strongly felt about social causes. So I, I could see that, you know, I could see myself standing and protesting for things and, you know, being a champion for other people. But at the same time, you know, that did not fulfill me as much as the whole idea of playing around with colors, fabrics, you know, just bringing joy to people through clothes. Mm -hmm. So I could... That was a part of me, but, you know, I could still do that while I was designing clothes. I could have a, a social cause in my clothing design. I could bring smiles to people. You know, I could do everything with, with my clothing. So, therefore, I went for, you know, fashion design. No, I love it. I always say I have a cousin um, who lives, because I'm from originally, my, my mom's from Columbus, Ohio, and he's a news reporter on CBS or NBC or something in Columbus, Ohio. And we're so proud of him. I'm proud of him. But at nine years old, he will walk around the house with a spoon and interview everyone. And I was like, <laughs> I always wanted that. I always wanted to know at like nine or 10, like this is my calling. But I guess I was talking back then. So I just didn't know that's what I was supposed to be doing. But I love people who bring joy to the world. I want to go ahead and introduce our next guest, Felicity. Ogumunku, and she's a visionary who doesn't see the world as it is. She runs an independent network, Unscripted TV. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm well. How are you? I'm excited to have you on the show. I'm excited to learn to see a woman, a Black woman in television with a network. So tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Uh, so my name is Falashade Ogunmokin. Everybody gets it wrong, so I got to drill it in there, but... Um, <laughs> I tried. I tried. I practiced a few times. I was close. I know, but um, but yeah, so I run Unscripted TV, which is an uh, independent streaming network that redefines the narrative surrounding the Black community. So mm -hmm. literally everything that's going on is what we focus on. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, right now, there's not a, a strong platform that actually does like news entertainment, um, all of the various fields to actually focus on our issues and mm -hmm. to make sure that we're being able to have our voices amplified. And then also there's a big gap between the content creators of color and um, other content creators who are in the, the mainstream. So mm -hmm. this is our place where we come together collectively with movies, documentaries, music videos, podcasts, everything so that we can have a, a community. And it's a super interactive platform, which means uh, while we're watching it, people can be in the comments, but we can also send people links to actual um, products where they can purchase it all without ever leaving the show. So uh, it's, I call it visionary revolutionary, but really it's, it's what we needed. Well, if you're a visionary revolutionary, then that must mean the revolution is gonna be televised. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. I love that. Now, you mentioned that you you don't see the world how it is. So that means you see it in a different way, a different... How do you see the world? Um, so right now, I see... It's, it's like... A, I'll use a movie. It's like a, it's like a movie, and I'm a producer. I'm able to figure out a way to see that the way things are, aren't that great. Like, let's just be real. Um, mm -hmm. The whole reason why I started Unscripted was basically from 2012 with Trayvon Martin. I worked in the newsroom. I did not feel like our voices were being heard. It really bothered me. I figured out a way to kind of start doing my own thing so that we could, we could start working together. And here we are in 2020, and we have a robust amount of issues that are surfacing that it almost seems like everything that happened in 2012, all of the marches, all of the things that we did, and even if we go back further, it just feels like none of that mattered. So mm -hmm. instead of me seeing the world like, oh, in 20 years, my son's gonna march for this same thing. I'm seeing it like, okay, so what is it that I can actually do? What's missing? 
How can I fill a void? How can we we show up differently? And that's really what I feel that Unscripted could do because then we'd be able to have a place to, to uh, share our feelings, to discuss mm -hmm. things, to actually be active in the approach to what we want for the future and um and not do it alone because like uh the previous guest was saying when she was saying and you know i i know her name San, sandia like when That's she was okay. saying um <laughs> that she could do protests but that she really loved the colors and clothes I was sitting here like, but you can do the protest with your clothes. And then she said it. And that's mm -hmm. exactly how I need for more people to feel. So yes, I'm focusing on building this network, but there's a business out there who needs to be seen who's doing something else. And then there's somebody who talks about finance in our communities that needs to be heard. And there's somebody else who's doing news. Like this is the way that we come together and we all use our skills together. Cause right now it feels so, um, we feel it feels so disjointed and I, I just can't wait to, for the solidarity to come back and for everything to just run smoother and that's how I see the world I see it as like a, a place where you can take these pieces and put them together and say all right this is what I want and this is how it's gonna be <laughs> that is beautiful I love it I, I can feel the emotion and the passion from here where can people tune into unscripted so you can go to unscripted.tv um, to sign on to the web page. It's going to stay under maintenance right now, but it's going to go back up uh, in a little bit. But okay. unscripted.tv. And then, of course, if you follow us on social media, we're able to really push you and guide you to everything else that's happening as well. But uh, mm -hmm. signing up is a great way. And then unscripted TV on Instagram, Facebook, it's the same thing everywhere. Okay. Oh, but it's so funny. Let me just say that. It's okay. U N S K R Y P T E D. Um, it's encrypted and um, unscripted mixed together. Cause there's there's like a, a, a hidden language that a lot of times other uh, people have, and it's just kind of showing that together in a new form. I love it. And in speaking of languages, our next guest is she may be able to speak a different language to the to the animals i say that she works with but dr holly gantz she is a pet and wildlife lover i will say and that's who she works with good morning dr gantz how are you oh good morning i'm doing fine how are you i am fine one of the things that i noticed and i don't know why this happens i think it's just the universe but i always see, seem to see a trend in the guests like there's always some trend and i'm seeing it now it's like we're talking about our passions our callings and the things that we love and where they come from so tell us a little bit about yourself dr Gantz, and what you do yes um i am a microbial ecologist so what that is is i'm somebody who studies microbes like bacteria fungi and other tiny things um, and i think about how they interact with each other and also how they interact with the animals that they live in or mm -hmm. among okay. and i focus on the gut microbiome mm -hmm. as well as the microbiome in the mouth but for cats and dogs i used okay. to work on wildlife as well there's a story behind that. I, I mean, this is one of those times where I'm tuning in. I'm like, there's a story. Just like, you know, the two other guests. How did you get into this? What moved you? What made you decide to want to study this? You know, I started off um, wanting to become a marine biologist. And mm -hmm. then, and, um, and you know, and, and that usually you think about bigger animals, but I just discovered that I really loved thinking about how little tiny things can can have big effect and they can affect mm -hmm. behavior. Like cats get a parasite called toxoplasma that mm -hmm. actually changes their behavior um, and changes the behavior of the mice that actually anyway makes them get more likely to be killed by a cat. So they get the, mm -hmm. the parasite can get into the cat. So these kinds of interactions are really fascinating. Um, <laughs> so I'm the nerd of the group, um, but I am very passionate. I think I'm the nerd of the group. <laughs> I like being a nerd. I don't know. I find that interesting that you wanted to be a marine biologist, but I'm like, I always see these little stories in my head where like I see, I used to love watching, don't tell anybody this, keep it a secret between us, 
but Pippi Longstocking, right? Like her whole thing was that she ran along the boat and that's kind of like what motivated her. So when I hear a marine biologist, I'm like, oh, she must have been on the boat. She must have saw the little animals. It was like, poor little animals, let me help you. <laughs> like, I need something that is going to move my heart. Like there, there's a story in you somewhere and I'm trying to get it out. Oh, Maybe I'm pushing well, too hard. No, yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, really with the ocean, I wanted to, to work to help you know, protect the oceans. I have, but now I'm working in the gut microbiome. So things can wander. Um, I found that it was very challenging to get, um, you know, faculty positions in marine biology. And, and I became really academically interested in microbiology. So um, I still support the oceans and believe that they're really critical for the functioning of the planet and do what I can to support them mm -hmm. outside, of, outside of my research. That's wonderful. One of the things that, that happened over the last two months is basically every human was divided into essential or non-essential, you know, and doctors, everybody, no matter what was essential, they were looking at, you know, people, uh, animals, how everything is affected. You know, I was reading articles around here where they were saying, because of uh, a lot of the restaurants being closed and all of a sudden a lot of rats were, were everywhere. It's like one thing affects the, the other. What are some of the things that you've seen in your research over the last few months? Well, you know, actually, um, so I run a company that's in biotechnology and I'm a, you know, microbiologist. So the, the whole COVID-19 epidemic is something that um, was not surprising in a way to us because we've been struggling to get funding for disease ecology, which is what I did my postdoc at Berkeley on studying wildlife disease. Um, and, you know, part of why I, I transitioned into creating my own business is it's really difficult to get funding from the National Institutes of Health or the National Science Foundation. There's just not enough money going there. And, um, and so I do have friends who've made the battle to survive in academia, but it's not, it's not easy. I mean, fewer than 10% of the grants get funded. People spend a tremendous amount of effort and um, where, I, where I went to school is UC Davis and they have this big PREDICT project where they were monitoring wildlife for diseases like coronaviruses and their funding was cut in September. They've now been given funding again, but um, you know, there's a lot that, there's many scientists around the world who wanna help and, and could, could be doing more to help prevent things like this happening in the future. Mm, so they had the information prior, but no one would give them the money and then everything hits and then it's like, okay, here's the money. I think as a society, sometimes we tend to do that. We're, we're more uh, reactive than proactive, you know? And, and that may be one of the reasons why we wound up in the situation that we wound up. Mm -hmm. so, so that's very interesting, excellent point. I wanna go ahead and introduce our next guest, again, sticking to the same theme, Melissa Lyons. She Will Always Love You is a part of her story. So she's going to talk to us about her story as well as remind us that all things are possible. Good morning, Melissa. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. Thank you for having me. So great to be Thank here. you for joining us. I, you know what? This is weird. Like the whole time I've been watching people just walk back and forth. I, I'm going to address this. <laughs> no, it's fine. But I'm like, hi, people. It's like, I'm like, they're essential. They're working. I'm like, you're sitting there. But I'm like, they're working. Where are you? What's going on? So listen, um, I... I have taken a really windy path to become this person. And I believe I'm an inspired thought leader in the sense that I work with people and help people. And I write about helping people become almost completely full of inspired thoughts so that we, we get ourselves where we need to be in align with our true self. And not too long ago, a, a drunk driver out of control hit our, car, hit our house. Mm. And it was quite a thing. So I'm displaced at the moment. <laughs> So I'm in another I place talking that. to you. Yeah, well, it's, it's good because we've, we've found good in this, this tragedy. Nobody died and um, it was, you know, life gives us these things to make us stronger. So this mm -hmm. is one of them. So thanks for, <laughs> thanks for not minding the people behind us. Mm, no, I'm um, just curious. It's a nosy yeah. person. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, I want to say that I, I grew up as a people pleaser and I really liked listening to the story so far because we talk about how we grow up and what we want to be and then what we become. And I spent my whole life becoming what society thought, what I thought society wanted me to be. I followed all the right rules as much as I could on the right timeline and did all those things. And I even had successful businesses. Um, and when I sold my last business now more than five years ago, 
and everything was good. I was left feeling um, still so professionally unfulfilled and so hopeless. And at times throughout the time, even when everything was great, I found myself hopeless with no reason, nothing that I could put my fingers on. And so when I sold the business and um, my husband finally said to me, and he said, are you ever going to be happy? Because anything ever going to make you happy? And I looked at him and I said, I don't know. I have no idea how to even begin to get that real true happiness because I don't know that I've ever felt it. And I've got two wonderful kids and a great marriage. Like all of that's right, but me, you know? Yes. Thing in your core. So I took three months off to find myself and I had an MBA type approach to it. I had goals every day and I meditated and I read the books and I journaled. And at the end of three months, I was so much farther away from finding myself than when I started. And my first lesson was that you can't, you can't force these things. And until you learn to surrender and allow things to unfold and trust in the universe and really align yourself to your true self, not the self that the world wants you to be, then it starts to really, everything starts to just unfold, you know? And I, I liken it to squeezing a handful of water. The harder you try, the farther it gets away from you, right? Right. And so, yeah, so that's why I find myself here. And at the end of the, the three months, which turned into 30 months, I had an inspired journaling experience where I actually channeled, and I didn't know that until many months later, I channeled a book called I Will Always Love You. And it's a journey from grief and loss to hope and love. And especially during these times now um, in COVID where people died alone and things like that, and people try to make sense of it, these words really help those people. Like thousands of people have really found value in them. But when I wrote them, I didn't know why they came through me until one day I realized that they were just a message from me to me telling me that I needed to step out of that person I'd been my whole life, which at that point was 50 years, and step into the person I was always meant to be. So depending on who reads the the book and, and where you are in your life it kind of guides you there and the beauty is it didn't come from me it came through me so it is it's inspired to um, move everybody so th that's my story pretty much in a nutshell I, I I gave up and then I got it all but not until I gave up did it come to me you are beautiful I mean that's all I, I can say it's like your spirit your energy is just it's just amazing. And you are so willing to be vulnerable. I mean, that's one of the things I just love about people is like when they're willing to be vulnerable, not to make money or not to, for a profit, but just so other people can be vulnerable too. Because I watch it in a show. It's like one person steps up and like, I'm vulnerable. Then everybody's like, I can be vulnerable. I can tell my story. So thank you. Thank you. How did you realize that you were channeling? Well, somebody asked me about the book. Well, first of all, the book is about loss when you first read it. And so my first thought was, is this a message that something's going to happen to one of my children? And I got really scared because our family, strangely enough, had never experienced tragedy or loss, which is very rare. My kids were, I think, almost in their 20s at the time when this all happened. And to not have any, any kind of real tragedy or loss was very unique. Uh, and then I realized someone asked me a question and I'd read while I was on vacation when this whole thing happened to me, uh, I'd read a book called Open Channel, but never did I put the two to together. Uh -huh. And the other reason is, is that I, when I journal, because I didn't, I don't think I'm, one of the things that I've really hit in my whole life is my creativity because that fear of being judged, that vulnerability piece has gone just top, like inside out in my life. So um, I write like book, chair, water, beach, TV floor and I keep writing words till I forget I'm writing and on that particular day the whole story came out with no mistakes it rhymed and it's 80 80 percent what you read in the what, that you read in the book it was exactly there like I don't like I, I when I, my husband he was in he was doing something he'd come out of the water and he said what happened it looked like something happened to you and I said I think I just wrote a book and he thought oh here we go because I've been you know, all these months trying to find myself he's like now what and when I tried to read the words to him I was crying uncontrollably and I was just like this when I started so it was just like all these to this day I sometimes can't read the words without crying so I know that they're just something like like way bigger than me Oh, so that's that's the channeling. So beautiful. That is, I have a lot more questions, but I want to introduce our next guest. And um, she helps small to medium sized business owners increase their revenue. So I know she's going to be able to help me as well as maybe some of our guests. 
I want to introduce Christy Jones. Good morning, Christy. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. I'm so excited to be. Uh, what a very impressive panel you have put together today. Thank you. I think we put this together. That's the beauty of it. You know, I have, give everybody a, a time and then people select the date and somehow, some way we all wound up here together. And that's the beauty of it. I love it. I've been enjoying doing the show. But 15 years, you've been in business for yourself 15 years. I've actually been in business for myself for a little over four, um, okay. but I've been in sales leadership. Um, I actually started as a buyer with, which is now Macy's. So okay. out of college, I went into retail. Um, and then I got uh, very disenchanted with the corporate world and really went out in search of um, a company, not a job. I felt like I had a lot of skills, but I wanted to work for a specific type of company. I wanted to work for a small privately owned company. I wanted to learn all the facets. Um, and I, and I, and I found that. So I spent 10 years helping build a company, um, with an owner about a little over a million in revenue. And I got there and eight million when I left. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that's sort of where I got my passion. I, I knew that sales was sort of my swim lane. As I say, um, in, in high school and college, I waited tables and I thought best thing ever was to get immediate feedback through tips mm -hmm. about your performance. And mm -hmm. so super competitive and that tip was my way of getting feedback about how well I had done so that I could make an adjustment for the next table. And so mm -hmm. I kind of got the, the bug by doing that and then went into sales leadership. Um, so at some point four years ago, I decided that instead of just doing this for one company, I could do this for lots of companies. Mm -hmm. um, my family had also owned a business growing up. So I understood the challenges. I mean, we'd had a fire at the office. There were years my dad didn't take a salary due to hard economic times. Like I'd lived through all of that. And so now I spend my days helping early stage startup founders, um, you know, take the, the little bit of money that they have that they've gotten either through PE or BC firms or family and friends um, bootstrapped and help them make sure that they succeed. It's a, it's a huge risk. Um, mm -hmm. It takes a lot of courage to quit your day job, as I say, and go into business for yourself. Um, and it, it, it does require a lot of vulnerability as we've already been talking about. So, I just, I just get, I really get a lot of, um, my passion comes from just helping other people. And I definitely want to make sure that they succeed. There's so many people with so many great ideas out there, um, but maybe not a lot of, of background in sales or marketing. And so, you know, I say like a lot of people have a great idea or they're developers or they can code, um, but they don't have that, that sales piece and it's uncomfortable for a lot of people. So I step in and, and help put sales process and strategy and, and hire people for them and, and kind of one-stop shop for getting them off the ground. Oh, I love it. And I, and I think what's important, one of the things that I always talk about is that, that solopreneurs kind of forget that there are stages. We decide that we want to be an entrepreneur. Like I always you know, have this conversation with my dad. My dad's been in business in California since 1985. He has his own plumbing and HVAC business. So that's one of the ways that I understand a lot about entrepreneurship. But I'm like, okay, dad, it's been since 1985. At some point you have to expand. To me, hi. To me, the only point is to grow, to create jobs. That's the, the purpose of business. It, you know, do you find that as well that too often people get stuck in that solopreneur mom and pop phase as opposed to focusing on expansion? Or is yeah. that even a necessity? Um, yes and no. I mean, some people want a lifestyle business and other people want to grow. Um, mm -hmm. As a solopreneur myself, that's a, you know, that is an ongoing challenge. I'm constantly talking to people about when's the right time to scale. Um, people hire me because I have a kind of a no-nonsense communication approach and my personality and bringing somebody else in. It feels a little weird to go sell a client and then, and then put them with somebody who's not me. Mm -hmm. um, so scalability is a huge, it's a, it's a huge conversation piece in my world. When's the right time to scale? When do we hire our first sales rep? When do we hire our first CFO? Um, cause it's, it's a big leap all of a sudden going from just supporting yourself to supporting other people in their family. You know, it's a little bit scary. Mm -hmm. What do you see typically though? Do you, do you see typically that a lot of them take that leap of faith or many of them decide, I just want to stay at this level? A lot of them take the leap of faith. Um, they, they have a bigger vision. And, and so really, you know, I, I work with very early stage um, startup companies where they get like, a, again, just like a little bit of funding, like, I mean, like $50,000, um, $100,000. And they go through kind of an accelerator program. So I call it like a 12 week boot camp, And I do a lot of mentorship for those type of, of organizations that kind of help people get off the ground. 
But their ultimate goal is to get sort of Series A funding, if you will, somewhere between you know three and six million dollars, so they can take off. So really helping them get that minimal viable product. So they have to have something to go to market with, right? So I mean, that's where you're kind of in the solopreneur stage for maybe longer than you want to be, because mm -hmm. without without that go to market product or service and having you know market fit, finding all of that, your ideal customer profile, all of those things, without that you can't do the scaling. But almost everybody I work for, that's that is not the, you know, being the solopreneur is definitely not the end game. Mm -hmm. um, again, like, you know, the big, the big vision would be the, you know, to e exit, right, at a 5x your revenue and, and go start your next business. So mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of the people I work with are serial entrepreneurs, as I call them, this isn't their first rodeo. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's, that sustains them. They love that. I think I call it like the three to five year cycle mm -hmm. where they'll do something and then they're going to get bored after about five years. So they're going to take it. They're going to accelerate it. They're going to try to sell it either to a competitor or exit um, mm -hmm. in some way, shape or form. So, but no, I don't think anybody's goal for the most part that I work with in that world um, is to stay a solopreneur. Everybody, everybody wants to grow their, you know, grow their company to double digit, you know, millions, 10, at least 10 million. Mm -hmm. Yes. I got to focus on that too. Growing my company, Ash Sharif for the 10 million. That's my, my focus. That's a good goal. Uh, Melissa, I had a question for you. One of the things that you mentioned was that you had several businesses before stopping doing that, going on this three, three to 30 month journey in order to find yourself. And you channeled the book, you wrote the book. How do you feel now? Do you feel the need to create another business or you're just kind of, you found happiness? Uh yeah, I, I feel the need to not necessarily create a business, but to follow my dreams, but the dreams that are like aligned to my heart. So it's different than a business now. Now I think I'm actually just going to just follow my path and see where it takes me. But I want, it needs to be financially viable. So that's the business aspect of it. But for the first time in my life, that's not what's driving me. What's driving you? Like I'm on this edge of my seat. <laughs> <laughs> what's driving me is that I, the thing that's driving me that I spent so much of my life trying to figure out and, and I made everything so much more difficult. And um, the thing that's driving me is to find that happiness in every single moment. And the, and the moments that I don't find the happiness to, to be grateful for the data that I just got that I'm not happy and then to redirect my thought to be happy. And that's, that's simply all that's driving me right now. And then of course, to share it. Because one of the times um, in the business that I did sell, there was a, a midpoint where I was so broken down. I think I was just days before being hospitalized and like a complete nervous breakdown. All my credit cards were maxed out. My line of credit was maxed out. I had about 18 employees and not even my husband could reach me. I was just gone. I didn't eat. I hardly could drink a glass of water. And one wise woman kicked me kind of, not literally. And she said, I had two girls at the time. And literally I was on the landing in my house and the girls were looking down at me. And she said, is this what you want your children to see? Is this the lesson that you want to teach them? And at that point, it was like, I started to see that there's so much I didn't know about just why I was meant to come here in this earth, right? This life. So it's kind of a long way of answering it. So yes, I, I have a business, but more than anything, I want to lead by example. And I only can do that by being true to myself. So it kind of flies in the face of the, the goal setting. It's more like intention setting now. I'm going to read this book because I know, like, I was, when I was talking to Dr. Gass earlier, it's like, I know something happened. Like, you, there's this shift, you know what I mean? Like, I got to see how this shift occurred. I want a little bit of that shift myself. Like, can I just, we just rub elbows or something real quick? Because I need a part of that energy. I need a part of that shift. Another person, another one of my guests, I want to go back to, Sundaya, uh, you mentioned Project Runway. And so I want to talk a little bit along the line of just believing in yourself and keep going and just knowing that this is what you're supposed to do because you could have given up, but you didn't. And somehow, you know, you wound up on Project Runway, which a lot of women, men as well, but they would literally almost kill to be a, on that show. Um, it's actually really funny as a fashion student, you know, in India, we would all sit together and watch it and Heidi Klum and Tim Gunn and, you know, a lot of the contestants, Christian Siriano and Mondo were like, you know, they were larger than life. Mm -hmm. Still, still some of them are. And never in my head, I, I imagined that I would end up in US or be on the show. Mm -hmm. 
but mm-hmm. i used to you know always have this overconfidence about myself because i was put down a lot first mm-hmm. of all being a girl child in india you know anyways you're a second grade citizen and then you know not the prettiest looking girl uh, fair not oh, fair skin i mean of course you know i i did not agree but you know mm-hmm. I, it was always like you know all this this is all noise it does not matter and i'm destined for something greater and then i just happened to move to us and apply to the show and make it on and i i realized that you know you set your own path and um, there are people who will pull you down but if you have self belief and you know if you set yourself up for that even if you know if your if your dreams are crazy let them be let it be unattainable but if they are crazy see those dreams and try to achieve them uh so it's yeah that, that's what the whole idea was and then yes i did end up on the show did not give up and still i'm you know polishing myself every day learning from my life um, when all the women sm- spoke i i saw a bit of me in each one of them you know i saw the the vulnerability the search for happiness because you know a lot of times we confuse uh, the search for happiness in uh, earning money it's not about making money or it's not about reaching somewhere that gives you happiness so it's a bit of everything it's a bit of community a bit of supporting each other it's also a bit a lot of hustle and you know it's it's a lot of everything that everyone spoke about so it's so interesting to listen to everyone else and then you know finding a bit of yourself in each of them that was beautiful i think that was well said I, I I definitely agree. Did you just make it seem so e- um, easy? I came to the U.S. like I happened to get on the show, but you you just seem fearless. I mean, that's the only thing that I can say. Was there ever any point of trepidation, or where you're like, "Oh my God, I'm doing this. I'm just a girl child. I don't know if I can." No, actually, never. I never. Um, I ha- I was so reckless in my ambition. I never thought these things. uh and like i um, i went to london to study and my my father didn't want me to go but i was so set on that you know i wanted to leave and i was the first one in my whole family who went abroad to study so i just boarded the flight myself my first international flight and i was so scared i couldn't sleep on the plane ride it's a, it's a 9 10 hour plane ride i got there i was so scared i was clutching on my money and my passport you know i was like oh my god what am i doing here you know uh, and and that thought was just for a fleeting moment and then when i got on the show it was all fun and j- right before we started shooting i couldn't sleep the entire night <laughs> i was i was somewhat stressed but again that was for a fleeting moment and then you know just just went ahead and did it i love it i love it dr gans i want to go over to you real quick i mean we're talking about all the stories and the fashion i mean you are in an industry that typically is male dominated you're in an industry where where people don't necessarily see our create creative side i mean how do you how do you handle it i mean how do you deal with it how do you feel how does that make you feel I mean there are actually a lot of women in the biological sciences more than half of the degrees go to women but we see oh, a good. big a big decline in the women who end up becoming faculty or becoming mm-hmm. leaders and or even being invited to be on panels uh, so like, talking about women in science even um so there are proponents who um like Jonathan Eisen is a professor I worked with when I was um at UC Davis and he helps to try and like promote women because he gets invited all the time to be on panels and he instead encourages them to invite women so many times even in business this is happening the world economic forum had a whole thing about like women in business and it was all men so there are definitely <laughs> big big issues there so what happened to me was that i was trying to get re- funding to study the microbes that live inside cats and dogs mm-hmm. and i am um, i it just it couldn't get funding from the nor- normal sources so i did a kickstarter mm-hmm. and um as part of the kickstarter i told myself that i was i was going to have my year of saying yes and so basically I, this was called kitty biome and um it was a citizen science to promote outreach about science because people won't fund science if they don't know about it or care about it right so we can't ask the public to support science other if we don't can communicate it with them and let them know why it matters um so i did this kickstarter 
And then I got invited by reporters to do interviews. And I'm an introvert. Those things were terrifying to me. But I was like, I just quit this thing on Kickstarter. I have to say yes. I have to do this because I want this project to happen. Mm-hmm. And um, and and so it, it also taught me to sort of step out of myself and not be, you know, embarrassed to make a mistake, you know, when I'm being interviewed. Um, and from that whole project, which was very successful, we raised about twenty five thousand dollars in 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 that first year of that project and we didn't offer anything really useful it's just a research thing like what's going on with the cats and the bacteria that live in them and then people told me how much their cats were suffering from um, a condition that's like inflammatory bowel disease which people get too so what we found was that one in five people have have these kinds of chronic digestive problems which is really really debilitating and and tragic Um, and that's the same for cats and dogs and so what I'm trying to do with my business animal biome is 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 create new solutions including at home testing as well as ways of restoring the gut for cats and dogs there are a lot of people trying to do this for people but um, people who have these problems they don't want the pets to suffer either and and pets are family today so i'm on this journey that chris chrissy jones is talking about definitely need to talk to you having a scientist (laughs) do do the sales and marketing it was definitely challenging but i didn't have any you know resources for more talented people until until recently so we started about four years ago not quite Sorry, but I thought it was very interesting um we have the same problem in technology and i think this is an interesting panel for this um you know they're just not enough we're not getting invited to panels we're not getting invited to keynotes um you know venture capital firms are not funding female entrepreneurs and founders at the rate that they're found that they're doing men um, you know, I say the biggest problem we have in Silicon Valley is it's white, it's a, it's a white man world. And, you know, and, and so I belong to a group called Women Sales Pros. Um, there are 50 female sales consultants like myself across the country. And we bonded together several years ago as a result of needing to support each other. And so like as an example, and I think this is, you know, this is something that, that we need as women need to do for each other. I mean, we're going to have to lift each other up and support each other, but as an example, every week we send, if we've written a blog post or we're gonna be on a panel or we're gonna be doing something, we send that to a central location. And every Sunday night we get an email saying, here's what's going on this week with our group. And we promote that on social media. We you know, reach out to each other to partner for clients. So if, if I've got a female sales consultant in another part of the country that specializes, like I've got a friend that specializes in LinkedIn training, I don't do that. You know, like why would I, why would I try to do that when that's her area of expertise? And so it's not, you know, it's interesting, but I bet everybody in their industry is having, is having some challenges in that area. And same thing with female sales consultants, very few female sales consultants, very few minority female sales consultants. Um, they're making less money. I mean, all of these issues, like we're just not making as much progress as we can be making. There are obviously a lot of social challenges going on right now in general, but, you know, I think getting panels like this together, but, but saying, you know, like, you know, somebody posted the other day, I'm on a forum group, like, can't find any good female keynote speakers. I was like, I have 50. Like, what are you, you're not looking, you're not trying. I I love that. Thank you for sharing that because number one, I want more information. I'm sure our our listeners want more information because I would love to be a part of of the group. Uh, I just launched my webinar, Don't Let Hating Sales Stop You From Becoming a Successful Entrepreneur. And so a lot of people, they get afraid of sales. And so they're like, ah, you know, in sales is my background is, you know, one of the things that actually started me out on my career. I was a trainer for a sales trainer for cheap tickets, a sales trainer for American Express. So that's kind of my forte. I love to sell. Um, Back to what Dr. Gans was saying about her Kickstarter. I understand because in everything that I do, I wanted to kind of expand. So I just launched my $50,000 production fundraiser, which is a Facebook fundraiser. And it, the link is on my Facebook page for the round table, as well as Ask Sharifa. But it was, it was, I felt kind of vulnerable because it's like, okay, you have to go ask people for help. You have to ask people for money, but and it, it was, it was vulnerable for me. But I said, you know what? I really want to be able to do more advertising and reach more people because look at the guests. I mean, I want everyone to see you. That's, that's my dream. That's my, my vision, my goal. The thing that moves me every morning is for the world to meet the people that I have the opportunity to meet, but it was very vulnerable for me, Dr. Gans. Oh yeah. It's really hard to ask people for money. 
it's just there's i don't know if there's anything harder than that but mm -hmm. um but sometimes you have to do it and you just have to accept that a lot of people are going to tell you no and you just yeah. have to keep you have to keep asking and you improve your message but you have to keep putting yourself out there yes um, can I call, may I call you Sade? I just may, yeah. I, may I just call you Sade because I've been trying to bring you in, but I'm like I don't want to mess up her name again. Sade, you been I'm about to jump in too. Well, jump on in there. What you just gonna say to us? Well, I mean, um, I have a background in sales too. It's crazy. I've sold cars. I've sold phones. I've sold everything that you can possibly think of. But um, the the hardest thing is, of course, asking for money and then listening to you know, the disparity between how there's uh, the, the men are the people who end up on the, the with the better positions and with everything like that. So like I'm listening and I'm like, I absolutely understand. And then to add in the fact that I'm also a black woman. So like that even adds an extra layer of I'm not going to give you money to my, to my uh, approach. So it, it's really hard to ask for money. And especially when you're doing it for something that's so specific. But what I've been noticing now is that because it's such a need and because there's such a passion behind it that I have to like let that go. So I did, I started a Kickstarter right at the beginning of Miss Corona. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I was so upset that, that, that it happened like right then because I, I felt, I felt wrong to ask people for money when I knew that people were losing their jobs, that people mm -hmm. were scared and that they were, so even as strong as what the, the goal was that I was working towards, I knew that I had to stop. So now that everything is coming back where we absolutely, absolutely positively need what I'm doing, um, I literally just made a new donation page last night because because it, it needs to happen. And if people really, like I'm hearing a lot of people that are, that are allies and i'm gonna call all of you that because i'm hoping that that's what i'm hearing but i'm hearing a lot of people that are allies that are trying to step up and trying to find ways to support and to help and it's definitely with helping uh people unify and to to do this type of work um so that we can feel secure in our own space and our own right in our own skin <laughs> uh, so um so yeah i was just agreeing like it's it's so hard asking for money especially when you're so deeply rooted with passion in what you're asking it for because then when you get that no it's like mm, you know but, but I, and i'm not like that because now i know like this is way bigger than me just like just like uh melissa was saying like this is way bigger than me so how it happens the way that it flows um it's just pretty much getting to it but but yeah disagreeing. I felt that. No, I, I felt that too. But I felt one of the things that you said is I didn't start mine right when COVID hit. I started mine like basically in the last week with everything. And it, and it had nothing. I wasn't in response to what was going on in the world. It was coincidental. But I'm, I'm asking for money and people are like, don't you see what's going on in the world? We're trying to help black people. I'm like, I'm a black people, you know what I mean? But it's, it's like, they, they're like, no, we want to give money to this person or we want to give to, you know, money to Black Lives Matter. And I'm like, my Black Lives Matter, you know what I mean? Like, but it's like people during certain times, it's like, they're looking, I get that. They're looking at you like you're wrong because you're asking for money. And I'm like, I, I would think this is a per perfect time. So I definitely support you. I understand. I, I get it. You know, I want to talk to you about what it would take to have a show on your network. I love to be able to expand. I love to talk. I'm pretty sure that we, you know, put our heads together. We can come up with something. Again, this is why I do the show. So I can set five appointments to, to better my life all at one time. So I already know I'm going to be reading <laughs> Melissa's book. I'm going to be on Unscripted Network. Christy's going to help me expand. Sundaya going to make me look fabulous because i know that's what you do <laughs> and then i'm gonna get some pets and i'm gonna be like dr Gantz, how do i know what's wrong with this pet that was my question that i meant to ask because you were talking about the the gut and the animals how do you know when your your pet is suffering from gut issues you know it's usually it's pretty obvious like it's chronic diarrhea or chronic vomiting are the main things or a lot of pets have skin conditions so those are okay. the top three things that we help with Okay. 
because people like me, you have to give them instructions because I tell people, and this is me, I'm always honest with who I am. I tell people I don't have pets. I don't have plants. My kids, I have two kids. They're 23 and 26 and they are alive because they can talk. They were like, mom, are you going to feed us? And I'm like, <laughs> I guess it is dinner time. I guess you guys do need food because they have to remind me. So I don't, but I will get some pets one day. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of nonverbal communication with dogs and cats, although they're better than a house plant in terms of letting you know. <laughs> <laughs> Christy, you were going to say something? Yeah, I actually had a question for Floss today. Um, Sade, I, um, with everything going on, you have a very unique platform, right? And so, um, again, living in St. Louis, obviously we went through the Michael Brown situation. So actually things here are not as volatile as I sort of expected them to be. And I'm happy that the, the protests are peaceful. Um, I actually am a mother of a biracial child as well. So this is a sensitive topic for me. Um, how do you like, how are you feeling about the situation? It feels a little, this one, this situation feels a little different for me. Then the other situations have felt. I'm not sure exactly why. I don't know whether it's because we were coming out of Corona and all this happened. Um, I might, but, but the way people are reacting and the way people are coming together, particularly in my city too, um, feels a little different. But because you have this very specific platform, like how are you going to use the platform during, I mean, you know, like during regular times, but this is not regular times for a lot of reasons. How are you using the platform to educate people, get the message out? Great question. So honestly, one of the things, one of the things that, that I'm noticing a lot of, and, and one of the things that's a big problem is that we have a lot of amazing um, uh, producers, reporters, and videographers that are in every single city, but they go out to these protests alone. You know, they're going out like writing a blog or just making a video or just saying something by themselves. So the whole point of what we're doing is we're trying to make sure that we're unifying them. So that way the person who's a reporter in St. Louis can work with the videographer and can work with the producer to actually go out there together and put something together to actually share the narrative that's happening on the ground. Because oftentimes the reporters aren't reporting from the, from the protesters' point of view. They're oftentimes reporting from the reporters' point of view. And sometimes the story gets completely lost. It doesn't have all of the narratives, all of the stories to actually give us a robust feeling, it paints a different picture. So while we're, while we're working with getting our, um, our creatives mobilized to, to work together to share that type of content, we wanna do that all the time. So the platform is linear, which means like 8 a.m. news, 9 a.m. finance, uh, 12 p.m. Uh, a podcast or some type of talk show. Um, and the evening nights, there's web series, which we're actually going to start calling sitcoms because this, this is what this is what they are doing. Like we have shows that live everywhere and this is a way for them to come together. So um, right now it's important for us to come together and you're absolutely right. But also beyond that, we need a place just for entertainment. We need a place just for music. We need a place where we have all of these different type of content creators that can be in a forum to build and grow together and that that's how that's how we plan to use it even after this and then moving forward because things like this keep happening it keeps us informed so that way the next time something does happen in um st louis or in uh minneapolis you know like we're we're abreast to it instantly instead of having to look through instagram and find out that something happened and then days or months later in Ahmaud Arbery's case, find out, find out about it where it becomes a big deal. Like this is a way for us to know about it now, to press on it now so that we can, we can change um, how people are reacting to what's happening. We want to be proactive. So uh, that's, why, that's why we're doing it. And I appreciate you for asking that too. Nice. You're welcome. I just wanted to answer your, your question, Christy. Um, I don't have a whole network or anything like that, but I talk to a lot of people. And what I believe is that is, it is the perfect storm. It's the perfect storm between people who have been locked, you know, quarantined for 
two months sitting at home, frustrated, agitated, ready to go out, ready to go back to their normal lives. And then you have the George Floyd situation happen. And then you also remember that this is an election year. So you have a lot of people who are already agitated and frustrated and they want change and they want a, a difference. So I think it's a combination of all of those things that happen. That is why this one, because I felt I agree with you completely. I well, felt that different this time. It did. To me, it did as well. Yeah, I wanted to. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt. No, no, no. I go ahead. Uh, I also think it's four years of, I don't know if we can make it political, Trump talking, you know, kind of promoting white supremacy. And uh, I'm a person of color and, you know, I have seen systematic racism at my end too. So with what, whatever he said, when, when Charlottesville happened, he was like, they are very fine people. They are not writers or, you know, they're doing nothing wrong. And suddenly when people are actually silently, you know, protesting in peace about something that happened and all of us have seen, you know, happen. If there wasn't a video, you know, you know something uh, on the unscripted line, if there wasn't a video, George Fl uh, Floyd would have lost his life in vain just because somebody fancied his power and wanted to kill a black man, you know, his life would have been gone. So it's, it's all of that anger that has kind of, be, it has been built in us over four years of listening to Trump talk all that nonsense. You know, it's, it's time that, you know, we speak against it. And think black a lot of people, lives matter, yeah. I think a lot of people are feeling that and feeling that frustration. Now we are coming down, you know, because we could probably go on forever, especially on this topic, but we're coming down to the last few minutes of the show. And what I love to do at the end of every show is just allow my guests the opportunity to speak directly to the audience, to everyone who's watching live, as well as everyone who's watching in our archives, and just let them know what you like for them to take away from your appearance. So we're going to start with you, Sade. Great. <laughs> Um, uh, one, thanks for having me on the show, but to the audience and everyone that's watching, uh, as you know, this is a perfect storm and it's a time for us to really come together, um, from all views. And it, it would be great if you could support Unscripted TV. Um, we do have a brand new donation page. It's on Facebook. I can actually share the link, but also to just watch. We have a new show coming out on, um, Sunday that's called The Bag, which is like a QVC like show for black owned businesses to show their brands and people to actually buy it directly. And we want to continue to do that type of content and build that type of place for us to, to just support each other. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and then after um, the show, please go to the page and drop your donation link in the comments um, for this show. Um, uh, Christy, what do you have for us? Yeah, again, thanks so much for having us on today. Um, this has been a, good, been a great panel. Um, again, I think, you know, I, I want everybody to, to be encouraged to take a risk to do something. Um, I say I have 30 minutes for everyone. So <laughs> if you need advice, I've got 30 minutes. So you can go again, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, my company is salesaccelerationgroup.com. And on there, I've got a Calendly link. So you don't even need to reach out. You can just stick something on my calendar. And I'll add a Zoom link to it. Um, but I really do like, I, I think it, uh, right now it is a lot about giving back um, and, and trying to help other people get ahead. And I think I always say like, you know, if everybody just did the right thing, then the right things would just automatically happen. And so I try every day to, I think, I think most people know what the right thing is. And sometimes it's harder, you know, than you want it to be, but to speak up and say something, you know, to say something that might be uncomfortable, um, but getting comfortable with being uncomfortable is how we're all gonna grow. So if you need any help on anything, I'm here, I have 30 minutes, hit me up on my website or on LinkedIn and stick a, stick a time on my Calendly and let's get to know each other. I need 35 minutes. Like I, I just like to break off the rules. Give you extra five. You extra five. <laughs> but I, we gonna talk, Christy. We definitely gonna talk. I, I wanna do some things with you. Dr. Gantz, what do you have for us? Well, we're all about gut health. So our health is foundational to everything else that we do. And um, the gut microbiome supports brain function, digestion, and more. If you have a cat or dog who has digestive problems or other health problems, please feel free to reach out to us at animalbiome, A-N-I-M-A-L-B-I-O-M-E dot com. And we will do our heart, try our hardest to help you to improve the quality of their lives because our pets are family today and we want them to be happy and healthy and, and live a long, full life.
Oh, that is so beautiful. I just love that. I, now I just want to get some pets, just just because. <laughs> After two days, I might bring them to your house, though, Dr. Gans. But right now, the emotion no is kidding. there. I've taken in a few Foster, so don't worry. Sunday. Um, uh, I would just say it has been so insightful to, you know, be a part of this show and listening to everybody's journey. And uh, yeah, if you're looking for color, for joy, for inspiration, for world travel, uh, read about uh, a lot of it on my website and you know just email me i'm always available to talk to uh, listen to people it need not be related to fashion just let's talk about life you know i i can be a friend that you know is always there for you i need more friends you got 40 minutes for <laughs> see i'm working on 40 I, minutes right now I, I, yeah yeah most definitely <laughs> <laughs> i'm just giving you a hard time melissa what do you have for us Okay, well, I believe I've come to understand that we're always one thought away from making our life better or taking our lives in a different path away from what our true purpose and sense of life is about. And I think all six of us here have said the same thing. We all started doing something and we've all somehow shifted into that thing that life has called us to do. Some of us sooner than others, but every one of us and the passion is so strong and deep. So I would like to say for anybody out there who's looking for that passion or for some kind of help making that shift into living your true life, I have a 30 minute consultation available on my website, which is melissa-lyons.com. You have to remember that the hyphen and you can sign up and talk to me. And um, I think that you're all inspiring. Thank you. And so if I just wanted to say to you, you already said it earlier, but you already had, you did your shift. When, when one door didn't open the way you wanted, you opened the door that was calling for you. So you had your gift and shift at that time already. Thank you. That was beautiful. But I want to keep shifting. That's, I just like to go and keep and learn. That's why I invite everybody here so I can learn from all of you. I can build new relationships. Where can people pick up a copy of your book? Uh, it's on Amazon. Um, it's called I Will Always Love You. And you need to put in my name, Melissa Lyons, or Whitney Houston comes up. And that's never a bad thing to find. <laughs> After you've listened to her beautiful song, then you can shift over to the book. Um, so it's on Amazon. And I also have the same book. It's about the law of attraction and hope and love. And there's one for when pets die as well uh, for Aww. Dr. Holly, too. Um, yeah, because they're such a part of our lives. But thank you. Oh, see, that might be a collaboration. I don't know how that's going to work, but I think that's beautiful. I want to thank you all for being here today. Thank you for being my guest. Thank you for giving up your time, your energy, your stories, your business, your smiles, your light, your energy. So thank you. I definitely appreciate you. And I'm going to copy and paste all of those thank yous that I gave to my guests to my audience. So I want to thank you all for just being here, for tuning in, for watching the show live, for sharing the show. If you haven't shared the show, please go ahead and share the show. Weren't these amazing women? You got to share it with your friends. And if you're interested in being a guest, please visit the website at asharifa.com. I appreciate all of you. I thank you. And until tomorrow, everyone have a safe and a blessed day. Bye now.